Thank you for joining us here in the in Campaign Central for Joanne Roberts' campaign, Green Party candidate here in Halifax and deputy leader of the Green Party of Canada. We're joined by the leader of the Green Party of Nova Scotia, who also happens to be our federal candidate in South Shore St. Margaret's, Thomas Trappenberg, <laughs> and Richard Zorowski, who is an elected member of Halifax City Council and is a very, plays a critical role on our shadow cabinet in the development of Mission Possible. Richard Zorowski here for Halifax West, oh. and Lil McPherson, Yay. the Ooh. indomitable, <laughs> the extraordinary <laughs> Lil McPherson running in Dartmouth Coal Harbor. For those of you in a national audience who don't know her, she's a local entrepreneur, climate change activist, and a former candidate for mayor. Ah, et maintenant, je suis dans un grand merci à tout le monde pour tout le travail pour ce moment maintenant avec notre plateforme et pour le lancement de notre uh, budget, uh, les coûts uh, des initiatives et les nou nouvelles sources de revenus. I'm really, really pleased and proud to stand here in front of you. I want to acknowledge we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq, and to them I say, Walalan, thank you. We also have some other thank yous, which may be a bit unusual as I start this conversation. Uh, the Green Party of Canada's platform is the result of the work not of some backroom party staffers or focus groups, but as I indicated earlier, Lil, Joanne, Richard are all part of the shadow cabinet of the Green Party of Canada with many others across the country. And we actually work based on the member approved policies and then we look at it again and say what do we need to do to meet the expectation of Canadians. This platform has a lot of content that wouldn't have been there if we hadn't undertaken a tour called Community Matters to visit every single province, we went to 34 communities and listened. And that's 10 provinces and the Northwest Territories between February and August. Mostly low carbon travel, mostly by train. That's another story. But it informed a lot of this policy. Then we took the ideas we had for new initiatives and met with the Parliamentary Budget Officer and his staff initially in May and again in June. Mm -hmm. And we started the process of figuring out, and it was, it's an enormous benefit to Canadian democracy that our Parliamentary Budget Office had its mandate changed, and to this I have to thank the Liberals for putting in place changes to the Parliamentary Budget Office to make it part of their mandate to examine party platforms. We'd like to make it obligatory in future elections mm -hmm. that all parties submit their promises to the Parliamentary Budget Office because then Canadian voters have a third party, nonpartisan expert group to look at parties' promises before an election. So this process has been a long one. But it, I also want to say the one person who was with me on this journey was the Director of Policy at the Green Party. Uh, Angela Rickman, who came with me for the first meetings, kept working on this process. Between our first meeting with the Parliamentary Budget Office and the end of June, she was diagnosed with ALS, and she's on disability leave, and I hope she's listening, because even after that diagnosis and even having, having to leave work because of the accelerating symptoms of ALS, she's kept at it. She kept working on the budget. She kept calling the, <laughs> our, our, the senior uh, analyst at PBO who was working with us. And I have to say to Dr. Yun, the whole PBO team has been amazing to work with because they, they, they're straight shooters. They do number crunching. That's their job. But I just, I just wanted to give a, a big thank you to Angela because uh, – a lot of people would have, said, would have said, I don't have time for this now, guys. I, I'm done with budgets. Yeah. Uh, Angela, you, you did it. You, you got us to the finish line. And we're really, really grateful. Another person who thanks, who helped a lot on the budget process, uh, on our staff, Steve Parkinson, but our finance critic in the Green Party of Canada. <laughs> this is news, okay. My, our finance critic in the Green Party of Canada is John Kidder my husband, <laughs> and uh, he's, he's, he also started working with Angela at the point of her diagnosis so that we had more backup, and we've, we've, the, our blood, sweat, and tears has gone into making sure that we could number crunch 
some key promises that we've made to Canadians and deliver them. So a few quick notes, just so it's very clear that the Parliamentary Budget Office reviewed 24 of our planks. This is not, we would never want to say that the Parliamentary Budget Office has signed off on our platform. We need to draw some clear lines. We asked for 24 specific items, the big ticket items, to be reviewed. We are releasing every single one of the items that the Parliamentary Budget Office reviewed. We've asked the Parliamentary Budget Office to put everything they did for us for this platform and for this costing analysis, the pieces done by the Parliamentary Budget Office are public. C'est une grande différence entre nous et les autres parties parce que actuellement nous avons demandé au budget, au bureau de uh, budget, uh, budget d'officier parlementaire pour le budget, de, de, de rendre absolument public les, les recherches pour nous. Nous avons demandé d'avoir uh, 24 uh, éléments de plateforme analysés par le, le bureau de officier de budget parlementaire. Je vais donner un grand merci à toute l'équipe de ce bureau. The, the office, the parliamentary budget office has done an amazing job in analyzing. So we know that we have the revenue coming in to cover some very large new programs. We are able to put before you a budget that is balanced in five years, but to do that, we have a number of really large new revenue pieces. Let me remind you of the spending promises we've already made. We said we'll bring in universal pharmacare. We said we'll abolish tuition. We'll invest in post-secondary education. We'll provide universal child care. We'll meet the expectations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women. We had to revisit our budget to find $2 billion for this year to meet the new, new ruling of the Human Rights Tribunal that the government of Canada owes Indigenous children $2 billion. We had to go back and say, OK, we've got to find $2 billion in there. Those things we have done, and how do we do it? Well, the big ticket items, Pharmacare, turns out to be a cost. If you look through the budget, I'll tell you what page to look at because we have, by category, all of our spending is laid out. Uh, on on uh, health care and the parliamentary uh, and the Pharmacare piece, in this very next fiscal year, 2020 to 2021, is almost $27 billion. It's the next, and in 21, to 22, $28 billion, and in 22 to 23, $29 billion. But it's essential. We have to do it. So we accept the Parliamentary Budget Office's analysis. They have a caveat, which you'll see when you look at the document, that they didn't take into account savings that accrue through bulk buying of drugs. They didn't take into account the provincial contributions to pharmacare. So when you see those items, we have included the reduced cost of buying the drugs, and we used the statistics and the analysis from the Eric Hoskins report done for the federal government. But it doesn't change it much. It doesn't change the bottom line on Pharmacare much till we get to year three, and then we should begin to be able to negotiate with the provinces because they will be saving a lot of money. So the provincial contribution to Pharmacare doesn't kick in until year three of Pharmacare. Now, I'm probably diving into too many of the details, but I think it's worth explaining. That is the single biggest big ticket item in what we, in what we promised to do. And here's the revenue pieces that let us do it. We're applying a very small tax on financial transactions. That will give us $18 billion by 2025. We're raising the corporate tax rate to be the equivalent of what it is in the United States. That will give us almost $16 billion. We're closing the capital gains loophole. That will give us almost $15 billion. We're applying a tax to commercial banks on their profits. That will be a bit more than $4 billion. Going after tax havens, We've been aware of since the Panama Papers of specific Canadians who've hidden money offshore. That gives us about $5 billion a year. We're applying a wealth tax, 1% on tax of wealth above $20 million. 
that will give us $7.3 billion by 2025. And we're canceling a range of fossil fuel subsidies. That, of course, is about $3 billion. And another area which I think uh, bears a note, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's time to bring the Amazons and the Netflixes and the Googles and the Facebooks into the tax regime. They mine our data and make a lot of money out of Canada. It's only $1 billion by 2025, but it begins to level the playing field. And we close the loophole that lets people advertise on Google and Facebook and pay less in tax than if they advertised in the Chronicle Herald or put an ad on a local radio station. These are the things that uh, bring in enough revenue that we are able to meet these promises without increasing taxes for Canadians. There are no income tax increases regardless of your wealth. There are changes to the way we, for instance, remove the corporate uh, exemptions for entertainment, uh, things like owning a bo renting a box at Skydome and writing it off. That comes to uh, a significant amount of money in a federal budget. Maintenant, je suis vraiment fier de, de, lan de lancer notre budget avec la plateforme. Je veux dire un grand merci à tout le monde qui a travaillé fort pour ce budget et dont un esprit de responsabilité et de la transparence et de transparence nous invitons les Canadiens à examiner nos propositions de recettes et de dépenses. Nous sommes fiers de présenter une série d'initiatives ambitieuses visant à éliminer euh, les échappatoires fiscales et mettre fin aux subventions euh, aux entreprises d'énergie fossile. Je veux dire quelques mots aussi de, de l'oléoduc de Trans Mountain. On doit euh, annuler the oleoduct Trans Mountain. Uh, and when we cancel the Trans Mountain pipeline, you'll notice that when we say fossil fuel subsidies are stopped at $3 billion, mm -hmm. the Trans Mountain pipeline for $4.5 billion, the, the old one, we can never get that $4.5 billion back. They're still laughing about it in Texas, but they've got our $4.5 billion, and we own that pipeline, and that's not going to change. But spending a further 10 to $13 billion, we will not do. Now, you don't see on our line item here that we've recouped 10 to 13 billion because, and Canadians, have, people have asked me, how did we buy a pipeline for $4.5 billion? Where was that in the budget? Of course, it was never in a budget. It's what's called a non-budgetary transaction. And on that same basis, we can cancel spending another 10 to 13 billion, and that non-budgetary transaction saving will go to the infrastructure we need for a Canadian grid strategy. So I'm, I know I'm diving into too many details. I think we'll stop at this point, and all of the candidates here are open for questions as well. I didn't mention the shadow cabinet titles. Joanne Roberts is co-chair of shadow cabinet, and because of her huge and impressive journalistic career, she is our critic on arts, culture, and media. Uh, Richard Zawarski, given that he has a PhD in meteorology, okay, so climate. <laughs> Lil McPherson, local food and food security. Uh, her restaurant, Wooden Monkey, here in town. If you're a journalist from out of town, may I recommend Wooden Monkey? <laughs> and, and it's definitely uh, farm to fork. She knows her suppliers really well, and they bring in what they have just grown, and then uh, happy customers get to eat local healthy food while supporting a local economy. So Lil is as green as they come. Okay. Okay, and Thomas no, didn't mean to leave you out, darling. Okay, he's a fantastic human being. Uh, as Stephen Lewis once, I love Stephen Lewis. I once watched him at the UN introduce someone for whom he had no biographical notes, not a single note. And he said, I'm afraid I have no information on Dr. Sutherland, but I am reliably informed that as he walks through his hometown, people rush forward to clutch at his raiment. I thought, okay, that's, that's Thomas Trappenberg all over the place. Okay, so um, the question, s'il te plaît, je veux, nous sommes disponibles pour les questions en anglais ou en français. Hi, Lister, I'll start David Aiken, Golden News. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So just on the, uh, the balanced budgets, yes. uh, obviously two of the three, uh, well, I guess, see, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure where you are balanced budgets last election. But we were well, balanced. So three of the four mm -hmm. major parties in the last election committed to balanced budgets. One did and that one won. And one might think that Canadians would rather, they don't mind a little deficit spending, um, so long as we can be ratios yeah. uh, sort of thing. So give me your thoughts about why it's important for Greens to 
get to a balanced budget? I thank you for the question because we've never been slavishly addicted to balanced budgets. We completely agree that if you need to spend to stimulate the economy, that's an appropriate thing to do. Canada's current debt to GDP ratio is quite stable. Uh, if you look at the long term fi fiscal sustainability of the federal government, we're in good shape. Uh, we really are. At, at, you can't say the same thing, unfortunately, for provinces or some municipalities, but overall, Canada's fiscal health at the federal government level is very solid, and interest rates now are so low that it makes sense, as our budget does, to spend money now. We are investing in a lot of infrastructure. We're taking one point of GDP, or other GST, yes. one point of the GST, uh, which will go entirely to municipalities for infrastructure. We need to do that. The liberal promises on infrastructure, as you may recall, were pretty back-end loaded. We haven't seen a lot of the infrastructure spending yet. What Canada's economy really needs right now is a lot more investment. We've been, we're, our, our, our GDP growth is roughly 1.5 percent per year, and it's mostly in the services sector. So we really could, it, investment's been pretty flat. So we are not ideological about balanced budgets. But we do know that it matters to Canadians. And Greens believe in living within our means economically and ecologically. So we come to balance in five years. But as I said in the McLean's debate, as to Paul Wells's question, if there was a, a change, if we saw a reason that we needed to increase deficits because of a change in circumstance, we'd respond to that. But we believe Canadians need to see fiscal responsibility. It's something that Greens have always cared about. And we balance the budget in the same period of time in which Mr. Scheer plans to balance the budget. But we do it by expanding revenue because we're significantly expanding social programs. So usually the words balanced budget tend to align with parties that are prepared to cut deeply into services to Canadians for austerity. We are not like that. We think we need more spending. We clearly need spending. We've put $400 million in this budget just for the just transition strategy for workers in the coal sector who are seeing phase out coming soon. Uh, we're the only party that has done that. We're serious about protecting workers in the transition to a non-carbon economy. Uh, so our commitment to budgets is, that are balanced is not ideological, it's just prudent. I just want to chat a little bit about, uh, you mentioned Canada needs investment. Um, the dot-com era, mm -hmm. much like perhaps the green tech era, a lot of similar, same entrepreneurs, yeah. they've often complained that taxes on capital gains reduce incentive for entrepreneurs to sell their business and be a serial entrepreneur and start another business. And a lot of your uh, tax initiatives on wealthy, on that sort of thing, may not produce the investment in new green tech firms, which I'm sure you agree yeah. we all need. Well, we have funds in the budget for venture capital. We have funds to assist green tech firms get up and running. No, I hear you. There's arguments on both sides of going down the roads where we're going. But we know that Canadians need, we, we don't want to add taxes to individual Canadians. That's clear. The, we do call for a complete overhaul of our tax code. I should have mentioned that by now. We have the last tax commission we had in Canada to examine whether our tax regime was actually fair and progressive. That was in the 1960s. So we are, and this is interestingly enough, a call of the uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce. They want it too. Let's look at our tax regime and see if it's fair. We have so many different governments since the 1960s that have layered, one might say larded, on to our tax code so many complex boutique tax cuts, accelerated capital cost allowances, all manner of complications that we want to root and we have a root and branch review and reform of our tax code. But clearly, the lower, lower and middle income Canadians and even fairly wealthy Canadians uh, can feel that they're overtaxed. The super wealthy are definitely, the 1% of Canadians are seeing increased levels of uh, income and wealth creating a growing gap between the 1% and the rest of us. And we don't want to go down that road. We want much more equity. So that's where we're looking at the closing the capital gains loophole, closing the stock option loophole, and working to support small business. We don't change the tax on small business, not a bit. We raise the tax on larger transnational 
corporations, and to the extent that, and, and I, I, I love working with entrepreneurs, and I love seeing them spin off their businesses and help other entrepreneurs get going. Honestly, in looking at our budget, I don't think we've done anything to chill that kind of entrepreneurial zeal. We want to work to ensure that Canadian businesses also have the kind of robust support from the government of Canada in patent protection as they go into a fairly predatory world of global capital. Uh, well, but as, as Prime Minister, should that happen, I definitely want to sit down with entrepreneurs and if they're experiencing a problem because of the way we've structured this, and I've met with a number of entrepreneurs in, in establishing this budget, we have a number of informal business uh, advisors, I, I think we've got the balance right. Those are over now. And well, I'm wondering how if you would be looking to accelerate the yes. transition away from coal and new models. We have to we have to our our plan, Mission Possible, calls for decarbonizing our electricity grid and expanding it rapidly so that every part of Canada would be able to sell from one province to the other, that the grid itself would be 100% renewable energy. This is a key step in the deep decarbonization of our economy. So burning coal is one of the first things to go. There, and mining coal as well. Now, the, the task force on coal sector workers has already gone out, met with the communities, met with the workers, and Nova Scotia should be able to rely on 100% renewable energy from, for instance, Hydro-Quebec. Right now, there's a pinch point. Hydro-Quebec's power gets as far as Moncton. And it's not actually a physical pinch point, as far as I can understand. It's just been historically that we haven't accessed Hydro-Quebec there's a lot of renewable energy available to each part of Canada from another part of Canada once we get the grid system working properly. So we don't want, and we don't want to uh, leave any part of Canada behind. We don't want any worker to feel insecure. Uh, one of my favorite moments of aha, uh, Eureka, was uh, as a as a um, former uh, resident from most of my, my uh, formative years and uh, through my 20s living in Marguerite Harbor, um, we used to take the trailer down to Inverness and we used to buy a ton of coal and li literally dump it back in the trailer, take it home and burn it in the warm morning furnace. And that strip mine coal, the Evans coal mine, all that activity that was going on in Inverness has now turned into the Cabot Links golf course. Not necessarily all of it, but the part along the shoreline so we have the same number of people employed now in the Cabot Links Golf Course, which, as I think a lot of people from Inverness County realize, has raised the economic activity of the region quite substantially. No airport, thank you very much. But uh, it's, it, there, there's a transition to be had. And there's jobs in a decarbonized economy. And we, we, we should never, ever have allowed the Donkin Mine to open. Klein Coal should never have been allowed to reopen the Duncan Mine. That's an atrocity. And the workers there, non-unionized, in a company from the States with a terrible safety record, we should never have allowed the Duncan Mine to reopen. But the federal government gave it a pass, said they didn't need to look at the climate impacts of opening the Duncan Mine. In any case, Nova Scotia has specific challenges in a number of areas of the economy. We are here to say that the economic opportunities for Nova Scotia are greater in a carbon-constrained world where we focus on industries that benefit this economy. More renewable energy by far. Energy-efficient homes that you don't waste money heating the outdoors in the winter and cooling the outdoors in the summer. Tourism, our fisheries, arts and culture, making films. I mean, there's no, there are a lot of really vibrant economic opportunities in Nova Scotia that governments have just ignored the places where we can employ the most people and raise the quality of life and the standard of living. And of course, Greens are very firm on child care and pharmacare and a senior strategy and a dementia strategy and reducing the cost of housing, which isn't as critical a problem as Nova Scotia, although in some areas it can be. It here. here it is here, not a problem in Marguerite. Um, but affordability is a key issue right across Canada. 
Once you eliminate the cost of filling your car up at <laughs> the gas station, once you eliminate the cost of buying fuel oil for a house that leaks it to the outdoors, your life is more affordable. Add in that we will work with every province. Our goal is guaranteed livable income so that we eliminate poverty right across Canada. Every part of Canada will benefit from our platform. Well, the, when you regulate under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which we, the power to regulate is there, that becomes obviously one, one province at a time. We'd have a conversation, a respectful conversation and negotiation. But the federal toolkit includes the ability to say you can't produce this much CO2 from this particular facility, and then that's that. Yes. be clear that our policies, and I'm very happy to at some point, I know that Richard and Joanne and Lil and Thomas are all chomping a bit to answer some of these questions, so I will. St our plan here is not optional. Our plan is based on global science. Our plan, if you heard Greta Thunberg yesterday at the United Nations, is one that we think Greta might find acceptable. Maybe not. We are not talking about politics here, and we're not talking about illusory promises. We're taking the steps that are necessary because we can't continue to burn coal here or around the world. It needs to be shut down as quickly as humanly possible. We need to stop de being de All right, so I'm going to explain. Mission Possible, which we launched in May, says that by 2030, 100% of Canada's electricity will come from renewable sources. Our grid will be 100% decarbonized by 2030. That's about as fast as we think we can do it. Mm -hmm. But let me point to some of the things that make sense. Our commitment to a Canadian grid strategy means that the grid isn't physically loaded and full. It means we think that, you know, that's one place Andrew Shear and I can be found in agreement. This country needs energy infrastructure. He <laughs> thinks we need pipelines. I think we need an electricity grid that works from coast to coast to coast. And not just me personally, that's Green Party policy. If we look at where do we create more energy in Nova Scotia, this is a, a, a theme of our platform. We democratize energy. Consider the town of Chester. It's been how many years now, more than a decade, that, that Chester has a windmill that produces enough power that that's, last time I talked to them in Chester, several million dollars towards the town budget comes from the wind power that they have. Every community should be able to generate its own renewable energy, direct, creating a revenue line to local communities because it's not right that the municipal order of government in this country has only one source of revenue, and that's property taxes. By the way, negotiating with every province on a new health care accord, essential, on climate, essential, would be done through our reimagined federalism, a version of, through a Canadian council Council of Canadian Governments that brings Indigenous governments and leadership, municipal order of government, provincial, territorial, and federal to the same table to work things out. Uh, so again, back to when you could, 100% renewable electricity, a grid that is decarbonized is doable by 2030, and it's essential. Otherwise, the carbon budget is the real budget. I mean, I'm holding up a budget, les chiffres en papier, c'est un budget, vraiment. 
Mais la, le budget qui était maintenant primordial, c'est le budget de carbone planétaire. We have a carbon budget. That's what Greta Thunberg was speaking to at the United Nations. Given the amount of carbon we're allowed to burn, we run out of everything in eight and a half years at current rates of burning. This isn't optional. This is what we have to do if we want to ensure that the stability of the global atmosphere and climatic systems allows children alive today to get to their natural lifespan in a world where human civilization functions. It's not about the environment. It's a, it's a security threat. It's not a joke. We're right up against it. And that's why Nova Scotia and every other part of Canada, Alberta, and every part of the world, China, and, and China's invested more in renewable energy than any other country on Earth. So we're not in this alone as a nation, but we're going to have to get our own house in order so we can step up in the world and say, everybody has to double their targets or triple their targets. Because right now, Canada's target is the same one left in place by Stephen Harper. It was unchanged yesterday, despite Justin Trudeau's announcement, which was the right goal, zero, net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. Well, the news to Justin Trudeau and any liberal candidate, which is everybody in Atlantic Canada running for re-election, you can't get to net zero in 2050 with your current plans till 2030. Our target, 60% below 2005 levels by 2030, is exactly double what Stephen Harper put in place in May 2015, which the Liberals initially said was too low, was weak, was unacceptable. I remember Catherine McKenna saying in Paris, the Harper target is the floor, we're going to do better. Somewhere in 12 months between when the words left her mouth in Paris and a year later, the floor became the ceiling and they haven't reached it yet. Right? So we're not here to play politics about climate. We are here to say science demands these actions. You can't negotiate with physics. And if school children can see this as clearly as they do and march in climate strikes on the streets because we're stealing their future, that's not rhetoric. That's what we're doing. We're stealing our own children's future, and we know it. We can pretend we don't. But we can right now step up, face facts, and say, those days are over. We have a plan. We want everyone to join in together because this is the moment for societies to rally around. There's not as good a word in English as there is in French for this, but no, le, les mots en français, l'idée inspiration, pour moi c'est inspiration, c'est l'idée d'un projet de société. It's a projet de société, c'est tout le monde ensemble. Hein? Tout le monde sur le pont. All hands on deck. We do this together or we fail. We do it liberals, conservatives, bloc, Green, New Democrats, we do it together or we fail our children. That's why our targets are derived from science. And I'm sorry that the Nova Scotia government's targets aren't, but they, they will be, I'm sure, willing to join the rest of the world and the rest of Canada. When a lot of Green MPs are elected, they'll see the handwriting on the wall. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about your national plan. Just oh, yes. No, we budgeted the revenues to cover it as opposed to asking them to cost it. And uh, Halifax Council recently launched an idea for using nuclear rail to set up its nuclear rail system. We didn't quash it. Would you like to speak to that? Yes, I would. No, okay. it wasn't oh. quashed. Yeah. Okay. Why, why do you think that it will work on a national level when sustainability did not look like it was going to work on the local level? Well, first of all, via rail, status quo via rail doesn't work. Via rail should work. It doesn't have even a, one of the things in our platform is to create a legislative framework for what via rail is supposed to do. Amtrak in the United States has a legislative framework. It gives it a mandate to provide affordable transportation for Americans. Via rail has no legislative mandate. It's run as a crown corporation with a board that I think has charted a course for via rail to be an antique system designed for tourists. So. We need to modernize via rail. We need to invest in via rail. We need Canadian steel for tracks for via rail, not 
a whole new set of tracks, but as you'll see in our platform, 10 kilometers of new tracks here and there can help Via Rail run on time. We need to electrify the engines. Even I, mean, I look at my carbon footprint all the time. I'm getting on the train today to get to Montreal tomorrow. I take the train a lot, and I'm ve very well aware that it's an improvement on driving or taking a plane. But if you compare the carbon footprint of Via Rail to any train in Europe, we don't compare very well. We need to modernize, enhance, have daily service, and then Via Rail becomes the backbone of a national transit strategy with spurs or spokes to the hub, however you want to visualize it, with light rail, buses. Canadians in rural and remote communities are so underserviced compared to citizens of even developing countries, much less modern industrialized countries. We need to invest in high speed rail. So I, I will ask Richard, because I don't know what the Halifax City Council said on this matter, and I'd like to know. Uh, and I, th that's one thing about Green Party folks is we admit when something is new information, and I'd sure like to know about what Halifax City Council said about Via Rail, and if my intuition is correct, it was just the way it works now that was a problem. But I'm guessing. Just, just oh. Before, just before we get into this, could you say tell me how, what kind of input you got from municipalities? Um, I went from, as I said, 34 communities. I met with mayors. I, went, I met with mayors right across the country sat down with mayors to hear what was on their minds. Surprising how much I heard about the opioid crisis, how much I heard from mayors in New Brunswick that the workers who came back from the oil sands came back with addiction problems, became back living on streets, how they brought problems that they never saw. I mean, I'm, I'm a maritimer. I didn't know that would be what I'd hear from mayors. I heard from mayors about the lack of support for infrastructure. I heard from the mayor of Mission, B.C., oh, this is a killer. They've got a f almost 40-year-old sewer line running under the Fraser River, and it's cracking. The federal government said they'd help them with the infrastructure to build a new sewer line. They said they'd give them $7 million. The mayor came back and said, we've had to cost these additional things, like it costs $250,000 a day for a monitoring vessel in the Fraser River while we're doing the repair work. We need more money. The federal government said, and okay, uh, in the Maritimes, um, I need to underscore what the Fraser River means to us in British Columbia. It's our salmon. So there's a sewer line that's about, that is cracking under the Fraser River, and it needs repair. The federal government, when the mayor came back to them and said, and I just was talking to her, the mayor came back and said, we need more money to build the project. They said, sorry, no more money. And since you can't do it, give us back the $7 million we already gave you. In the same month in which they announced $220 million to LNG Canada, which is a consortium of foreign companies, to build a project that blows through our carbon budget. So I've listened to mayors a lot because I learn a lot from the Municipal Order of Government. I also frequently meet with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and we made sure that our budget meets their expectations and what they're asking of all parties for committed dollars for infrastructure. Yes. 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 Yeah, we did. I was at that meeting. Yeah. 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 And we had a very agreed because I asked him this. But well, you get to week. the microphone. Thank you. Well, I one of the things that we really want here in Halifax is to have via uh, do a seven days a week as a tr a train from here to Montreal. So the Chamber of Commerce was having a big event here in town, and Mayor Savage was there. So I went to, to ask him if he'd support that. And he's not quite ready to do that, uh, but uh, because he doesn't think we have the population. So we looked at what would happen, because there's quite a lobby here to make that happen, if we put that in as a hub where we brought people into the city so they could make that travel. And he said, well, you know, if someone was willing to support it. Uh, yeah, $700 and, <laughs> million a year. So we have put that money in this budget to support that so that that can start to happen, and then you build a passenger uh, you know, you start traveling by passenger train. So, yes, we've, we've spoken to Mayor Savage about it. I think he's supportive as long as he doesn't have to pay for it. Yeah, uh, Richard, did you want to comment? Yeah, I, 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 I did want to comment on the, the fact that uh, Halifax Council quashed uh, the deal with uh, CN Rail. We did not. It was an in-camera session, and uh, we've been negotiating with uh, CN, uh, I think, in good faith, uh, trying to create commuter rail, which of course was Councillor Outhit's original premise. We've been working on it for the better part of a decade, and the response that we got back was so onerous. The, um, 
the, the shareholder uh, direction that CN takes is purely about shipping, it has nothing to do with passenger oh, okay. rail. So they decided that we were not a priority at all and that in order to do any sort of a study, they would create the conditions that were so onerous that we couldn't we couldn't possibly agree to them. And if we did agree to them, we'd bankrupt the city, basically. And so there is no political will on um, a federal level or a provincial level to make sure that CN comes to the table with a municipality like HRM, where we try to make decisions for the best interests of our, our residents. And what you get back is, oh, Halifax City Council has quashed the deal. That is not the case. Okay, that's why I knew. And the other thing I want, I've also met with CN Rail. I mean, there are a lot of issues for transportation in this country. We've got such a, uh, there's, what you get when you cross the country and listen to Canadians is a sense that right across the country, while we are doing well economically and we have low unemployment rates, this is good. And we are a healthy, robust in industrial society with good social safety nets, we think. But when you cross the country and listen to people, you realize that the wheels are falling off the bus. Right now you can hear a couple of, a couple of them, just a few of the, the screws around the wheels and the nuts and the bolts are beginning to drop. We have to invest in Canada fast. We have to invest in our healthcare system fast. We have to invest in post-secondary education. We have to invest in our infrastructure. And because the stories you hear make it very clear that different levels of government are so busy kind of papering over the problems that they're not willing to address them. We're willing to address them. And I, I mean, I look at something as simple as getting prairie grain to the port of Vancouver. This is the kind of conversation I have with CN Rail, which is what put it in my mind. Well, Harper killed the wheat board. Who would have thought that that would lead to large freighters using free anchorages in my riding and making my constituents so unhappy. Who would have thought it would mean that prairie farmers can't get their grain to market because the wheat board used to consolidate the sales and have more predictable shipments? What happens with a container ship that has, well, not a container ship, rather, a freighter that has four holds? So they pull up at the port of Vancouver and they can get some grains. They fill up some grain, and then the ship goes back and sits at free anchorage. The whole chain from prairie farmer through the train tracks being clogged to putting passenger rail on the siding costs prairie farmers money, costs the shippers money, costs the Port of Vancouver money, and costs my constituents a good night's sleep. And what does it start with? We're a modern industrialized society with nobody paying attention anymore to getting things to work smarter and better. And we think that against, you know, against whatever public expectations there may be about greens, we're serious about getting transportation to work better for the farmer, for the shipper, for the passenger, for the environment. These things come together around doing things smarter. She's wondering why the financial transactions tax mm -hmm. is 0.5% mm -hmm. in the costing, but only 0.2% in the platform. There seems to be a discrepancy. There is a discrepancy, and I, I'm glad, and thanks, Janice. I should have mentioned the fact that we knew there might be some glitchiness in not having had our full costing from PBO when we brought the platform out, and our change in the trans, it is a change. We realized that 0.5% was still trivial to those doing financial transactions, but in order to meet the higher number, we did not expect PharmaCare to be a $27 billion amount. We have adjusted and readjusted. That's the one place and absolutely correct. We went to 0.5 from 0.2, and it's absolutely correct that the platform language and how we budgeted, but we're, obviously where the two come together is the budget rules because we need to make sure that our revenue is sufficient to cover our, our commitments, and we were not prepared to reduce one iota our commitment to universal pharmacare. Oh, 
No. No, we just no. got it on Friday. No. We got we got our planks costed oh. by far, by the PBO and the platform was put to bed in terms of and I'm this is backroom stuff. There's no, there's there are not uh, let's see if there's any other ex examples. Um, our sugary drinks tax that you'll find in the budget was at the last minute as someone was editing the platform, they thought, that sounds like a low level of detail we don't need to include in the platform. It was always intended to be in the platform. A tax on sugary drinks is for the purpose of discouraging empty calories that lead to an increase in diabetes, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, the Diabetes Association. I was confident it was in the, in the platform, went back and looked, and where did the tax on sugary drinks go? Oh, it's in the budget. But it's not in the platform. So there are some areas of discrepancy. And unfortunately, uh, I made the call, I take responsibility for this, that we could not delay our platform till today. And we're not prepared to be uh, in, in uh, you know, September 25th, are we today? Yeah. I did not want a September 25th with an election that started September 11th, be releasing our full platform. There are very few minor discrepancies between what's in the budget and what's in the text of the platform. Also, they are, well yes, that was always in our intention for this, for this budget and this platform. Okay. And it was cost. And we knew the PB, Democrats. when I first met with PBO back in May that I mentioned, they told me they were, ta they were already planning to cost the wealth tax. So we didn't put that in as one of our asks, but we, we've, a, we absolutely adopt it. Okay. So that was in the platform. But that's it's, platform. it's in the, ta it's in the aspirations of the platform. It's not as crystal clear as it could have been. It was always our intention. So it's not a change. It's just clear in the budget now. And finally, are you happy with how the PBO costing has gone? Has it been carried about in a timely manner? I can't, I would, yeah. This is the first year in which the PBO has had this uh, within their mandate. Yeah. I can't say enough about how grateful I am to them. We were assigned a senior analyst from the beginning. We submitted more planks than other parties, it's true. It, it, we didn't get our final final on a few of these items till a point when, at the point that we launched our platform, we still didn't have absolutely all elements. And that meant that we were taking a bit of a risk, but we were confident that on the revenue items we'd already seen, that we could hit balance and meet all of our promises. Uh, there were some, honestly, surprises that meant we had to rethink our budget, make sure we could cover everything, make sure that we did our due diligence. I can't say enough about how grateful I am to the Parliamentary Budget Office for uh, the diligence for the accessibility um, and and you know when you're at, again our, in our particular circumstance where our key point person working with their senior al analyst um, received a terminal diagnosis in the middle of the process we also had an extremely close relationship and a lot of personal support coming from PBO for what we were dealing with internally it was um, it was harder than it might have been, and, but I can't say enough about how grateful I am to their, for their hard work. And there was the court decision of $2 billion. Oh, yeah, well, the, yeah, the, the Human Rights Tribunal. I mean, there were things that change as you go forward. We had to account for another $2 billion we weren't expecting to make sure that I could say to Cindy Blackstock and mean it, Green Party of Canada is fully committed to the decision of the Human Rights Tribunal. We would not go to court right. to appeal it we want to ensure that every Indigenous child who's owed a good start in this country knows the Green Party of Canada recognizes that $2 billion is just the beginning, but we will meet that court ruling. I just had the chance to go through some of the steps, and I, my, my questions might be better, I hope. I don't know. Well, they were good at first. They were really good. No, sorry. Um, please explain to parents why the RESP program should be discontinued. It's been a very popular program in my opinion. It's popular, but what it, does, what it doesn't do is it doesn't provide the kind of educational benefits that we provide through eliminating tuition and investing $10 billion in post-secondary education. So it's a popular program, but with no purpose once we've eliminated tuition. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, thank you. And sugary drinks. Yes. Uh, among all things, there's been a great debate in many jurisdictions about that. It's evidence of the nanny state, why do this? And I guess if you really want to tax things that are bad for you, why not just tax sugar, period? 
uh, wherever it shows up. I mean, there's any number of health studies that shows too much sugar wherever it comes yeah. is what's going to cause diabetes, cancer, etc. So from either side of it, it sounds like a very much of a half measure that's just kind of a virtue signal rather than something that's really going to get something done. I, I would respectfully disagree that it's virtue signaling, although I think I like virtue signaling better than vice signaling, uh, if we're going for signals. But w what, what the doctors have told us as a party, we have met with the Heart and Stroke Society. We have met with the College of Family Physicians. We have met with the Diabetes Foundation. I'm a member of the Parliamentary Caucus on Diabetes uh, and TB. We know that sugary drinks constitute empty calories that are now available in schools, in vending machines, and that if you're hungry and you grab a sugary drink, that will fill you up instead of going for an apple or a glass of water or some milk, right? We're looking at what affects the dietary standards of our children today. We know that for the first time, and, and as, as a child born in, no, no, a child, an old lady born in 1954, <laughs> when I was a child, we didn't have access to sugary drinks the way kids do now. The volume of empty calories offered to children today, and that's just one of the factors, a more sedentary lifestyle, there are many factors. Teeth decay. Yeah, there are Tooth teeth. Decay. Oh, we also have dental hair for, in the platform for anyone who's low income. But this is the first generation where we can look at our kids and realize they're going to be less healthy than we are. That, that's not a nanny state issue. The corporate state that now operates in Canada, we are as much, we are, we are living in an occupied state, as Dr. Ursula Franklin used to say, we're in an occupied state. Transnational corporations have occupied our democracy. A tax on sugary drinks is a small step, but it does communicate, it does mean that at the, the level of a price differential, it could encourage families to say, okay, less sugary drinks, more water, less sugary drinks, glass of milk, less sugary drinks, putting an apple in the bag to go to school. There's it's important. What well, you there's get also in there, a huge, yeah. Also, there's a huge environmental footprint. Uh, I had a good friend that was the vice president of HR for Coca-Cola, and I visited her all over the world. And we spent a lot of money on resources and water and energy to ship basically sugared water all over the world. So there's not just an impact on the health, which is huge, teeth decay, it is awful for kids. We all know that. This is, this is a no-brainer for me. But the environmental footprint to ship this bottled water, plastic bottled water, all over is another big game changer. There's a lot of ripple effects to one thing, right? So, yeah. So the tax on sugary drinks is a health measure advocated by experts, and we listen to experts. That's, that's our bottom line. Nobody has ever come to me to say a tax on sugary drinks from a medical organization, from a group of doctors, from a group working on a specific disease issue. No one has ever come to me and said, make sugary drinks more, wildly, more widely available. That'll be awesome. No, uh, that is something Coca-Cola will tell us. And Pepsi-Cola. Uh, yeah, yeah, not so much.